If you don't mind, turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. <clears throat> Today I want to talk to you about holding the love line. Now, I want you to think about the love line being as, and I'll use this right now. On the, on the side of the highway, there's a line. And if you've ever seen anyone who is being tested for drinking while driving, they got to do a sobriety test. They got to walk the line. And they do everything in their power to hold the line so that they get into no further trouble. But how many of you understand when you're intoxicated, it's hard to hold the line? Well, as believers, we cannot be... Um, intoxicated with the, with the world system and the events of life that we can't hold the line. How many of you know anger, frustration, bitterness is like an intoxication of destruction, but you can't walk the line of love when you are going through these types of events? So the kingdom of God comes along and Jesus Christ then points out to every believer that the greatest spiritual force in the kingdom of God and in this universe is love. And if you can hold to love, there's nothing that can hold you back. So everybody think about your life as if you're climbing a mountain to reach the crest. You want to reach the pinnacle where your life is getting maximum impact. The kingdom of God is now functioning, flowing, it's manifesting all around you, in your babies, in your... I mean, everything is good. But always remember this. Satan has strategic weapons of warfare set up against you to trip you up, to get you off the love line. And here's why. Because you're people of faith, and faith moves mountains. But the fuel to faith is love. Love fuels faith, because faith worketh by love. And so when you get frustrated or angry and you mouth off, Bad words. Now look, as men, we understand this. That we can be having this wonderful plan of romance with our wives and just say one dumb thing and run the whole day. Just kill it. Now you act like I, I'm the only guy. <laughs> what, what, what is it? Somewhere we got off the love line and you just messed it all up. So consider this. If you're climbing this pinnacle, going to the top, it's a climb. Faith is a work. Listen, the only work that you really have is to work on faith and love. You work on those things. Work the word. And the only real fight that you have to fight, you don't fight against flesh and blood. You fight for faith. It's a faith fight. You're always having to fight for faith. That's why it's, it's so important to be in the word, around the word. The word grows faith. So you say, well, pastor, what's my real job? Well, you may go to work like on a secular job, but your real job to get you to the top of the mountain is you work on faith. You stay in the word. Now, here's what I want to tell you. But in your climb up the mountain, strategic things will happen to buffet you. And if you bow your knee to any one of those buffets, at some point when you get to the top of the mountain, It'll have dominion over you to serve you. So you're going to have to serve it. Okay, so let's take for an example. If fear has been a part of your life all of your days, why are we still dealing with fear? Because at some point, we submitted ourselves to it, and so we still have to go through these fear issues. So we're still serving it. But if you overcome it, then there's no more service to it. So what about an angry person, an angry man or an angry woman? You can be doing fine and just one thing will just knock you off. Listen, if you don't overcome it at the bottom when you get to the top and then you have a lot of influence, you'll still be an angry man. What about lust? What about perversion? It seems like you can be doing extremely well, extremely well, but if you don't overcome it when you get to the top, you're just going to be a person on the top with a perversion. Oh, don't shout me down. It's just what it is. So our call to God is overcome the strategic weapons of warfare that are set against you to take you off the love line and to get you out of faith. 
And so the Bible says here in Matthew twenty-two thirty-six, 36, he says, there's a question posed to Jesus. And I want you to notice how he's addressed. He's addressed as master. Jesus is Lord of all, folks. Amen. And if you want to know how to live life, go to the master of life. I said the master of life. He has conquered death and destruction, and he provides to mankind life. So the question now is, master, which of the commandments, which, of the, which is the greatest commandment of the law? In other words, of all the commandments, I want to know what's the most significant of all the law. And Jesus answers, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. So everybody say, love, love. is the great commandment. And he says, in the second is likened to the first. He says, you shall love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two commandments, everybody say love commandments. Love commandments. This is how important love is to the, to the human being. It's a love commandment because it's the spiritual force that can get you to the top. It's the spiritual force that will cause you to be happy. It's the spiritual force that will get you well. Do you understand that love never fails? So if I'm dealing with a spiritual issue, a financial issue, a, a health issue, anything, then why shouldn't I go back then and check out my love walk? Because if love never fails, that means then in love is every health element I need. And it doesn't matter what arena of life I need health in. It has the remedy for my situation. Love does. So do I have to go back how far back do I have to go until you discover what sprung a hatred, a bitterness in my life, and then you sever it at the roots and then you move on? You got to get rid of it. And so the, Jesus says everything now hangs on this law of love. So again, I want to come across with this thought. Satan, let's look at these little notes here. Satan comes to get you off the love line. Because love is the highest spiritual force in the universe because it's God himself. It's God himself. God is love. And so when you are operating in the force of love, you're operating in the force of God. It's amazing. You can't separate them. You can't dissect it. If you want victory, you've got to walk in love. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. So for everybody today who is struggling in your love walk, I got good news for you. Check this out. There is no temptation that Satan himself can throw against you, but that is common to man. So everybody is faced with something that they have to go through. But God is faithful. But love is faithful. The temptation is sure. The temptation to be angry, to be mad, to be frustrated, it's uh, for everybody. Everybody has this opportunity to get off their love walk. I said everybody is tempted to get off their love walk. I said everybody, every day is tempted to get off your love walk. You ever got to that place where you say, boy, I just want to give them a piece of my mind. You know what that is? Off your love line. That's being off your love line. And so here he says everything that man is tempted with is common to man. So everybody's got to struggle with it. But God is faithful. Love is faithful. So let's look at it like this. So there's no temptation that is not common to man. But we know this for a fact. Love is faithful. So you can't go wrong. Love is faithful. Therefore... The word says, God or love will not suffer you to be attempted above what you're able to handle. But will with the temptation make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. In other words, love enables you to do everything. There's nothing that we can't do. How many of you understand Jesus said that you can take offense. So that means that offense can come, but I don't have to take it. Because love allows me to escape the offense. It just depends on your mindset. Because offenses come every single day. People say things. You know, I'll give you an example, all right? Because it was not my heart or, or my intendency, but I, I recognize after I said it, 
that my wife could have walked off this stage feeling as if I shot an arrow at her. And that was not my intention. She has an opportunity at that moment to either receive it as an offense or to say, I know better. That was not an, that was not an arrow. But if she takes it as an offense, I promise you before I get home, I'm going to hear it. <laughs> now, you say, well, you're protecting yourself right now. It's probably a little bit of both. <laughs> What's that? She is, she's not offended. She does not take offense. <laughs> Glory to God. But you see how easy it happens? And so the moment that you have the opportunity to be offended, the truth is love allows you the way of escape. So love, what it ultimately comes down to, love is agape love. And agape love is an aggressive love that has to be in action. Love is not something that's passive that you just kind of, uh, well, you just kind of fall into love. That's not how you do it. Love says, I'm going to chase you down no matter what you do to me. I'm going to love you. It's covenant love. It leads the charge. That's why you have to understand you can't get off the love line because you got to chase after it. Because agape love is the God kind of love because God chased you down. Remember, you didn't first love God. He loved you and he has chased after you. And you're in the kingdom because love ran you down and you finally said yes. Now, do you think the walk is over now? No. We, now we're to become imitators of the master. Follow him as he follows, Christ, as he follows Father God. We're to follow him. Now, let's answer this question. Who is my neighbor? Is my neighbor Rachel? Is, and the answer is yes. Is my neighbor Leah and Nick and Kayla? Yes. Brian and Lorraine? Yes. You? Yes. But how far does that go to be my neighbor? Now, when we read this, I want everybody to proceed the reading with, everybody lift up your right hand and say, Lord, help me. Okay, because you're commanded by love to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. And now you're commanded to love your neighbor as yourself. Let's define who is the neighbor. You ready? Okay, I want to ask you, are you really ready to find out who your neighbor is? Yeah. Are you really, really ready to find out who your neighbor is? Yeah. I know most of you are going, I don't know. <laughs> you, you're faking it till you make it, I understand. It's all by faith, right? Yeah. All right, here we go, Luke chapter 10, verse 29. But he willingly to justify himself said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. So we can look at it from this point. Jerusalem is a higher spot. Jericho is a lower spot. He left the high spot to go down to a lower spot. All right, always remember this. There's trouble when you leave the higher spot to go down to the lower life. I said there's trouble when you leave the high life to go to the low life. So let this be a warning to everybody here. Like for me and for you, I have to look at this and say, this is a warning to Dwayne, but this is a warning to every believer. You're in the high life. Don't go over to the low life. In other words, when you leave the love line, that's the low life. The high life is the love line. All right, so he says, this individual, he went from Jerusalem to Jericho, and as a result, he fell among Thieves, that devil is looking to take every human being down. He stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, departed, and left him for half dead. You ever felt like that before? You know when it happened? When you left the higher life to go to the low life. You got stripped, beat, bruised, beat up, left naked, and didn't know if you were going to make it. And by chance... Thank God, help is coming. You ever been out, if you haven't, I'm going to kind of tell you how miserable it is. You ever been out in a position where you went fishing and you went to this secluded place and it's the honey hole to go fishing and your boat broke down and nobody knows about this honey hole but you? And you sure hold it. Rachel's like, me and her, we've been to some of these adventures together. We know. And the boat breaks down. 
eight months pregnant in a rainstorm, <laughs> lightning flashing, pop your ass up in the air, net in the wheel, yeah, and you're hoping that a boat passed by. And a boat passed by, and he has no mercy on a pregnant woman. Now look, and by chance, a priest came that way. <laughs> the guy said, glory to God, there's help that's here for me. <laughs> and when the priest saw him, he passed on the other side. Uh, man, you know, if I stop and take care of you, it's going to cost me time, money. I ain't got time. I won't ask you how many times you walk by the wounded or how many times you're helped walk by you. You see, you can miss your God opportunity, you personally, but you can also be offended today because somebody walked by you when you were wounded. It's all about the love line, twofold. You can be the one who passes by, or you can be the one who's lying in the ditch and somebody walks right by you. Certainly, the priest would help but he passed by. Likewise, a Levite, surely this one's going to stop. And when he looked on him, he passed on the other side. But verse 33 says, But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him, and he bound up his wounds, and he poured in oil and wine. And he set him on his own beast, and he brought him to an inn, and he took care of them. And on the morrow, when he had to depart, he took two pence, and he gave it to the host. And he said unto them, Take care of him, and whatever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Now Jesus says, Now, which of these three thinkest thou was the neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? And he says, he that showeth mercy. Now you see that word mercy? That word mercy is covenant love. That, mer that, that is a reflection of God's love for man. He says, he's the one who showed mercy. He's the neighbor. Then Jesus says, hey, so listen, go and do likewise. See, that's why I asked you before we read it. Raise up your right hand and say, oh, God, help me. Because this is just too easy to walk by. You know, not long ago, it's been a, 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 over a year, we were on a, a little trip to watch Kristen play ball. And um, we watched a gentleman get hit on a bicycle by an automobile. And the, the miracle of it was that, it was a, look, this is the miracle. The guy got hit, bang. He goes into the air and he does this, boom, boom, boom. He's thrown, he's whipping through the air like this. And his bike goes up in the air. The bike goes like this, foom, foom, bang on the road. And his body goes, foom, 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 and hits the grass. Two objects that were one got hit. The bike goes up and smashes on the cement. He gets slung into the air and goes into the grass. And, and, and basically he, he lives and does well. And we were the first ones there. So... Get, get on the phone, I got on the phone, call authorities, they came whizzing in there, boom, boom, boom. And the thing that now I got to deal with is that that guy is bringing a lawsuit against the person who hit him, and I got to go through all the trouble of depositions and all the stuff. But you know what? It's worth it. Because when I was dealing with the authorities, my mom and Andrew... We're there on the roadside ministering life to him, speaking the word of God, praying for him, calming him down, and he lived. Now, the story being is that there's too often the reason we don't stop is because we think about what's coming up. And I don't want the trouble. And I understand. But love says, no matter what trouble comes my way, I got to walk the love line. Because it sets me up for promotion. So, so listen, your neighbor is anyone who falls on hard times. Let's, let, let's look at our note right here. I'm going to tweet you right here. This is a tweet. 
Your neighbor is anyone who has fallen on hard times. Because you see, love will always ask you, what can I do? Now here's the truth, and I want you to see this word love. You see, love, which is God, knows that all resources will be there and for them. In other words, it's just theirs. It's available. So what we don't understand is that we think that in our own ability to show up to help, I don't have the resources to do it. I don't have the spiritual resources, the mental facility. I don't have what it takes to meet that need. But love knows that within you, you have this new heart, this new mind. You have the ability to take care of all needs. You have that ability in love himself. And God knows that if you will show up as his ambassador in this earth, that your being there now alone has the ability to meet all the needs. All the resources are available in you. I said all the abilities to overcome are in you now because they're in God. God is love. So God, if you would say, well, well, God can do all things. True. But love in operation through you can do all things. John chapter 13, verse 34 through 35. Jesus says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now I want you to notice that as I have loved you. So Jesus now becomes the example of how the believer is to love. So you're to love one another. Now in verse 35 it says, By this love, by this love example that I've set and your willingness to follow it, by this all men shall know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So listen, your ability to quote scriptures is wonderful. Your ability to know spiritual insight is wonderful. But what really sets off the believer or sets them apart is your ability to love when you don't believe that you can. When you've been pushed to the edge and love tells you to walk right through the crowd. When everything is against you and God says, don't lift a hand, don't say a word, I will defend you. Now it may take years for, reconcilia for reconciliation to happen, but it doesn't change the fact that love is working for you. And I want to tell you something. Rachel and I have, have experienced it. We're in the process of experiencing how love is reconciling that which has been broken for a long time. Amen. You know, one of the beautiful testimonies that, that I can talk about was when Brother Leroy sat right there in that second chair. You, you, most people don't realize that for 17 years, when he handed the baton of that ministry, which is this ministry, into the hands of Dwayne and Rachel Bland, what happened was he basically prophesied over us at that time. He said, because I can remember having dinner with them and, and at the time of exchange, and he said, you know, um, you're a different man than I am, and you're going to have a different vision than I have, and so I don't know that I can help you, and so... I don't know what my place is here anymore. And at that point, severed himself from us for 17 years because he couldn't figure out how he could help me. And how many of you know sometimes the help you need is not in philosophy. It's not in a thought process. It's just the fact that you're present. Amen. I need you there. Uh, that's all I need sometimes. Sometimes all I need is Rachel to be there with me. She doesn't have to say nothing. She doesn't have to try to give me profound wisdom. My children sometimes don't need a profound word from God. They just need mom and dad there. Just there. Just knowing that you're there. It's just like the comfort of having mom and dad. You know, I'm, I'm 51, going to be 52 this year. It's just a comfort knowing that mom and dad are there. You comprehend? Just, just the fact that love, love just does that. And so Jesus says, how do people know that you're one with me? You just love. So what we're talking about is this, this is a new heart that God has given to man. Now, this new man has higher capacities to love than ever before. Now, you have the ability to go higher than you ever thought possible. 
But the question is, am I willing to pursue that? Because for me to pursue love means I'm going to lose more of myself. And that's the danger thing because I don't want to lose more of myself. You took too much away from me as it is. But love says if you lose yourself, you'll actually find yourself. And that's where we, we, it's hard to imagine. But when I sow myself into love, then I find my real God-given self. How do people really know that you're one with Jesus? It's the radical change like Rachel shared earlier. It's the radical change that I fall in love with God. There's no doubt your, your conversation changes. Everything about life changes. But the most difficult part about it is now that you fall in love with man. That's the challenge. When we were young believers and we got really active in the kingdom of God, it was all right that we went to another church until we started speaking the word into our family life. And at that time, there was a lot of confusion about what we had done. And so there were times where the hurt would, would come because people would say that I, Dwayne, took Rachel and brought her over into an occult. And so, and then Brother Leroy was the occult leader. It's true, huh? And we had to deal with all that stuff. Now, we could have taken offense, but we couldn't afford to because their salvation was too important. And the beautiful thing about it is before mother-in-law and father-in-law went home to be with Jesus, they walked with us for several years in this family. So they became a part of the Jesus cult. <laughs> Even though we're not going to call it a cult, but you follow what I'm saying. That was their early mindset. But they became a part of the Jesus family. But you got to overcome it. So the, higher, the more you love, the higher your capacity becomes. Romans chapter 5 verse 5 says... And hope maketh not ashamed. In other words, your faith in love will never make you ashamed. Because hope is the expectation that God's word is true. So your faith in God's principles will never allow you to be ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by God himself. And both God and love is given to you. So for any of us to say, I cannot love, is not true. It's a deception from hell that says you don't have the capacity or the capabilities to go to a higher level of love. You do. It's just by choice. And it's hard. Because in, in our life, and I think it is for everyone else, the greatest struggle is that you feel the fear of being rejected again. Anybody ever been rejected before? There's nothing good about that. It's the most miserable feeling ever. Now, I know that every person deals with this because a part of my story now that I can share more openly with, with Brother Leroy was that in our time together, Rachel and I walked by faith for 17 years. And we did things that the Lord would tell us to do, like... There was a time where we felt like the Lord says, <clears throat> the man is believing for an easy boy recliner. Go buy him one. So we went buy him one. But it didn't bring a difference. He just got a lazy boy recliner. He got blessed by God. But there was no change in the relationship. Then it was write him a letter and tell him how much you honor him and love him. And I remember telling the Lord, I remember exactly where I was. I was on the east side of Homa. This is how strong the word of the Lord was, that I was on the east side of Homa. I was about to go into the tunnel, going towards the mall. And right there, the Lord says, write him a letter and express your honor to him. And I really told the Lord, I said, are you going to ask me to do this again? Every time I do it, I'm rejected. He says, if you do it, I'm going to bless you with what you're believing for right now. Now, in those days, I want you to understand, it's not like today. We were believing God for a tape duplicating machine. All right? That was where back then we got DVD burners now, and you can bring a DVD home, or you can go online, and you can just download. But in that day, you had to get cassette tapes. 
and you had to burn them on to, make, to bring your messages home. And we were believing that we could step up into that, that limelight to have a tape duplicating machine. But we didn't have no money. So I wrote Brother Leroy a letter. I didn't know what that, I'll give you what you're believing for. Him. I did that on a Monday. Wednesday night, Pastor Lee Lamry came to church and he preached a message for us down in Chauvin. And he said, Pastor Dwayne, the Holy Ghost spoke to me this week. And so I want to give to you here. Here's a picture of your tape duplicating machine that I bought for you. And I got a thousand tapes coming to you. And the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost he said, see? I'm going to take care of you if you'll follow my lead. So at that point, I'm like, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. <laughs> and nothing came. Nothing happened for a long time. And then through a series of events, I got to meet them. Now, look, we're talking about 17 years. And then I met his wife one day at a funeral. And she spoke to me out of loving kindness and tender mercies. And she told me that all was well within her but to continue to pray for Leroy. And then she died. So in that moment, I had the opportunity to move into that situation, which I did not want to go. And this is when the, the Lord says, now go to her funeral. Like, go now. She died this day. Go right now. They're at the funeral home. I'm like, I don't want to go to the funeral home. You know, because it's always a rejection. And I went to that dark moment in that time frame and he accepted me into his family. Wasn't a lot of words. Wasn't a lot of stuff done. And he said, would you help me officiate her funeral? So I did. Went through that whole thing. I'm like, now we're on our way. Nothing changed. Nothing changed. So we get back at it again. Just keep serving Jesus. Keep serving the Lord. And then all of a sudden, out of the... No, the Holy Ghost, one day we're at the rec center... We're preparing to go into church, and the Holy Ghost says, write him a check today. I'm like, Jesus! Come on! Why is it me? I didn't do this. I'm pursuing him. Why can't he ever pursue me? He said, because I'm asking you to do it, son. So I wrote him a check. About a week later, I'm walking into the service, and I get a phone call, and it's him. And he says, I'm so sorry. For 17 years of hurt and pain, I brought to you. Please forgive me. And I said, I want to have lunch with you. Because I heard the Holy Ghost said, the iron's hot. Strike! I said, I want to have lunch with you. He says, Okay. And I've heard that before. I said, no, 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 no. Listen to me. I want a day. I want to meet with you like tomorrow. I want to take you to lunch. All right. Where do you want to go? I don't know. All right. I'm going to take you where I want to take you. I took him to the finest restaurant I could find in Homer. And at that time, a 60-year-old man sat across the table from me. And I asked him one question. I said, do I have permission to ask you a question? Yes. I said, why didn't you ever answer me for 17 years? And I wasn't like, I wasn't mad. You know, just like, why didn't you ever answer me for 17 years? Why didn't you ever answer me for 17 years? And he hung his head and he said nothing. I said, are you afraid? He goes, yes. I said, afraid of what? He said, rejection. <laughs> that devil lied to us for 17 years. And then in our conversation, we're just talking. We're just starting to get to know each other. And he said... Something about sleeping on an old mattress on the floor. And the Holy Ghost said, go buy your daddy a brand new bed today. I called Rachel and said, I, I, look, you're going to you're gonna have to bear with me right now. But the Holy Ghost just told me we're going to buy the man a bed. And I'm bringing him to the bed store right now. So you're going to have to trust me that I'm making a wise decision. And I bought, the, I bought the bed and he went home in a brand new fine bed. Now, what, when he passed away, it wasn't the same bed. So I don't know what he did. He, knowing him, he probably gave the bed away to somebody. And he went back to sleeping on an air mattress. But that's just who he was. But I gave him the bed. The end result was 17 years of his final years in the earth, we got to walk as just a potting us. And I didn't need him to speak into my life on how to build a church, how to grow a church. Didn't need I just 
It was cool just to have him. Just to have him in my life. But none of that had been done underneath normal love capacity. It took the love of God. On both parts. I'm not, this is not about Dwayne. I'm telling you straight up. It's about the love of Jesus. So 1 John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. In other words, everyone that loveth has the fruit of God in his life. He's born of God, and he knoweth God, so that means every day there's fresh manna. You want to find out what it is to walk in uh, just a perpetual overflow of fruit and fresh manna? Walk love. Because love is not a feeling. Love is God. And let me share this with you, because I understand, please bear with me. Forgiveness is love. Forgiveness is agape in action. It's aggressive love. When you should not have to do this, but you're commanded to do it for your good and their good. Why did Jesus forgive you? For your good, so that you could come into fellowship with him again. So that he could use you for his glory. Why do I have to forgive? So that I can believe God for reconciliation to bring back that which was broken so that together we can serve God underneath his headship. To walk in bitterness says, I have need of you. I have need, no need of you. And that's just a foolish statement. Let me tell you what God says about you. Isaiah 43 verse 25 and 26. God says, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake and will not remember thy sins. If God says, I blot out your sins for my own sake so that I don't remember your own sins, forgiveness is for you, Jack. If God leads with the example, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just I'm gonna blot it out. I'm not thinking about this stuff no more. I'm not meditating on the hurt no more. Because you can't move forward if you always look at the hurt. Every time you see that person, you see the hurt. I'm telling you, the greatest, one of the greatest revelations I had a couple weeks ago was when Darren Frank stood right here and he made the confession. It was, this, it was the story, it was, one, was everything it needed to be, but the confession that he made. He says, I forgive James, all right? I forgive my offenders. I forgive. Wonderful. But I expect they owe me nothing. Not even an apology. That set off bells and whistles. Like, if I really forgive, they owe me zero. And I had to pick that up and say, you know what? I owe, they owe me nothing. I owe them everything. I'm going to love you. And it set me free. Now, verse 26 says this. Now, why is it important to not remember sins anymore? Because the next verse says, put me in remembrance. Now it's about you, the offender, coming in the presence of a living God without any condemnation. So if you take it from a natural perspective, now when you forgive somebody, that person can come in your presence without any condemnation of their past. They're free. I said they're free. They're free in your presence. They owe you nothing. If God does it first, and he says, this is for my good, then I will believe that the creator of heaven and earth knows what's good and what's bad. And, he, and if, if I'm going to be an imitator, I need to follow his footsteps. Boy, you ought to be shouting me down or something, man. But I know this is tough because it's, it's rubbing you right where it needs to be rubbed at. So God, listen to me. This is for somebody prophetically. Let's go to the little note now. God did not foul away your sins. They have been forever erased so that you don't carry condemnation. There is no condemnation in the presence of God. That's what forgiveness is. That's what love is. That my offender has no condemnation in my presence. <laughs> you talk about a higher level. You talk about holding on to a love walk, Jack. There ain't nothing easy about that, partner. But I want to tell you something. When we start learning how to live that way, men and women will know, man, there ain't no doubt there is fruit in that man's life that he loves Jesus. 
There's fruit in that woman's life that they love Jesus. It ain't about how much they talk about, well, here's the law. No. Love walk, Jack. Love walk. I'm walking love. I'm putting all that stuff behind me. I got to press for the high calling of God. You say, why is it so important there's no condemnation? Because condemnation will keep you out of faith. And we live by faith and not by sight. So condemnation keeps you away from faith. How can you believe God for something when you're always being beat up about how miserable your life is because somebody did you something wrong? So faith is always dealing with the future. Faith is about calling things that be not as though they were. He, that's the importance. Faith is so important to the life of the believer. But love is the fuel for faith. So let's look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. Now look at this. For in Christ Jesus, how many of you are in Christ Jesus? You're born again, you love Jesus, you're in Christ Jesus. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision, that means the Jew availeth anything, nor the uncircumcision or the Gentile doesn't avail anything, but faith which worketh by love, it, it, that, that's the power, that's the power. Being a Jew, being a Gentile, pfft, that don't mean nothing. You want to know what it means something? Faith working by love. That means i got to look at that hard position and say, I'm going to overcome you, Jack. You hurt me bad, but you're not holding me down no more. I'm, I speak to you, mountain, in the name of Jesus. I will defy you. You're coming out of my life because you're tormenting me. And you got to overcome it. So listen to me. In every area of life, the tempter is there working, trying to get you off your love line. Because if he does, your faith doesn't work. So you got to focus on the love line. Focus on the love line. Focus on God. Focus on love himself. It's the first and great commandment. 1 John chapter 5, 18. For we know... That whosoever is born of God, he doesn't sin. All right? In other words, a repetitious, perpetual motion of sin. How many of you understand your, your perpetual meditation of the hurt is not good for you? The perpetual meditation of the offender is not good for you. When you're born of God, we don't do that. But he that is begotten of God, look at this. Keepeth himself, protects himself, herself, protects their heart. And look at the good news. And the wicked one can't touch me. Ooh, woo. come on. You want to talk about walking in tall cotton? You want to talk about walking in liberty? If I keep my heart, I stay on the love line. Stay on the love line. Everything is pushing against you. Everything, the wind, afflictions, pressure pushing on you, trying to knock you off the love line. But if I keep myself focused on the love line and I walk in love and I walk by faith and I do not give up my love walk, there ain't nothing the devil can do to me. There ain't no more torment. So 1 John 2 verse 15 So God says, so listen, all right, since it's so important, the love walk, love not this world. Don't love the system of the world. Don't love. Listen, we don't, you got to understand something. Love is, love is designed for two people, God and my neighbor. Love is not designed for your car, your house, things of this world. Love not the, the operation of this world system. Love a higher system. This is why the word says right here, love not the world, neither the things that are of the world. If any man love the world, the love of God is not in him. It doesn't mean that you're, you, God doesn't love you and you don't love God. It's just that you're not at the higher level. Listen, Maybe we need to rethink some things. Like the word love should be reserved for God and man. So instead of like, who I love me some ball crawfish. No, I really like crawfish. But I love God and my fellow man. 
Who I love that car. No, you don't. That thing is going to fade away. It's going to become, in five years, it's going to be old and decrepit. You want to trade it in and you're going to love another thing? No, you really like it and enjoy the pleasures of it, but you love God who provided it to you. Amen. All right, so let's look at verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not... It's, it's not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world passes away. That stuff gets old. It just goes away. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the value of love. In closing, here's why. It's, this Look, this is how we're going to close. Why is there such a battle to get me off my love walk? Verse 16 of Romans chapter 4. This is like your highlight scripture. It is the icing on the cake. It's the cherry on top. Okay? This is why there's such a warfare against your life to get you off the love walk. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace. In other words, everything is going to come from the outside's invisible world by faith. It's going to come by you believing in something that you can't see, but it's fueled by love. I love is my fuel, but I'm getting it by faith that it may be by grace so that he gets all the honor. You see, grace is the unmerited divine favor of God that only God gives to man. So I love, it fuels my faith, I move things into the, the natural world, but it was all by grace. It was all by God. To the end, that the promise, everybody see the word promise? That the promise might be sure to all the seed. In other words, we do this stuff to establish the fact that the word of God, which is the seed of the promise, will stand true in our lives. That the blessing of God manifests in my life. I tell this to you all quite often. Rachel and I talk about it a lot. But it's like... There's too much stuff that we see in the word that's not being manifest in my life right now. And the reason it ain't being manifest is only one person's problem right here. So if I don't have it manifested in my life, that means I got to come up to a higher level. I got to grow in my revelation. I got to grow in my understanding that by faith, it might be by grace that the promise of God be sure to me. That's why the enemy's fighting to keep you from the promise. Is to keep you from your destiny. Not to that only which is of the law, but that also that which is of faith of Abraham, the father of us all. In other words, it's all about the blessing. The enemy's trying to get us off of our love walk to corrupt your opportunities of receiving the blessing. 